thank you, Gwen. That was a, a great lead-in to uh, what I'm going to talk about, and uh, which is rain is silver, but in the context of Mexico and silver and why you want to be in Mexico if you're in silver. So I will be making forward-looking statements. I've been making them for a long time. I'm pleased to be able to say that some of my forward-looking statements have turned into some fairly tasty history. That doesn't mean that that's going to happen here, but um, I do have to tell you that I'm going to be making forward-looking statements. So why do you want to be in Mexico? World's, for silver, world's historic silver production is better than 48 billion ounces of silver. And Mexico has produced 12 billion of those ounces. So 25% of all the silver mined in human history comes from Mexico. So that would tell you as a first, first order of business, that's a good place to be. These are some graphs I put together from the literature. This is Mexico's silver and gold production from 1521 to 2007, which was essentially where Mexico first really broke out. Uh, you can see gold and silver follow each other fairly nicely, but you know things topped out around 100 million ounces a year of production, 1 million ounces a year of gold. After 19, after 2007, things absolutely skyrocketed. Uh, since that time, uh, Mexico has produced two billion ounces of silver. Uh, Mexico is now just under, having doubled its historic production, just under 200 million ounces of silver a year. Now, how do you get that kind of increase in production? Well, you start by recognizing that uh, Mexico is where to go for big silver. Now, if you look at the top 12 silver producers in the world, you can see that Mexico, Peru, and China are head and shoulders. The best places to be in the world for producing silver. Uh, this goes to 12 because I needed to include Canada, and 11 is an awkward number to cut things off at. Um, and when you consider that 70% of modern silver production, or 72%, as, as Gwen showed us, is byproduct, Mexico producing 25% of historic worldwide production largely from primary silver deposits is even more impressive. So when you look around the world, where are the big silver deposits? Well, it's very easy to see the big ones are in the cordillera of the Western Hemisphere, with a few of them scattered here and there. Big cluster in Mexico, big cluster in Peru. So of the world's billion ounce silver camps, there are 15 of them. Eight are in Mexico, including what is now the world's biggest, the Fresnillo camp in Zacatecas, which is at 3.3 billion ounces of production, uh, which just passed Cerro Rico de Bolivia about a year and a half ago, largely thanks to the Juan Escipio area. And most of the big deposits worldwide, billion ounces, are epithermal veins or carbonate replacement deposits. So these are deposits that Mexico is very well endowed with. Now, one of the things people have recognized for many years is that ore deposits in Mexico form these lovely linear trends. And this is one from 1923, which has played pretty fast and loose with the location of the sum of the deposits to get them on that trend. But it still gets across the basic idea that if you understand the trends in Mexico, you can focus your exploration. And so there's the major ore deposits, mostly silver rich in Mexico. It looks like a dog's breakfast. They're scattered all over the map. But if you break it out by deposit types, the vein deposits with the gold rich ones closer to the coast, the silver rich ones sort of in the central area, they start to form coherent patterns. Even more so when you look at the carbonate replacement deposits here in the eastern part of Mexico. So, Carbonate replacement deposits, two years ago, nobody knew what they were. But they are related to intrusives that are emplaced into thick sections of carbonate. Mexico is graced with hundreds to thousands of meters of limestone, in many cases structurally duplicated and triplicated to give you 2,000 meters of structurally prepared host rocks uh, right in the places where the intrusions come up, and you can develop 
really large deposits in these areas. From an exploration standpoint, uh, you follow them from where they crop out on the surface all the way back to the intrusive stock because unless there's post-mineral faulting, mineralization is continuous from the stock all the way to the, to the limit of the system. So the reason people have heard of these things is an outfit called Arizona Mining with the Taylor Discovery. They were bought out by South 32 in 2018 for 1.8 billion Canadian. Now all of a sudden everybody wants a CRD. And for me that's very good because I've been studying these things for about 40 years. So I have a reasonable handle on them. Uh, here in BC, JD, JDS's silver tip deposit uh, was acquired by CORE for 250 million bucks. I worked on that for Steve Robertson back in the mid 90s when Imperial Metals had it. Uh, they've largely used my model to find more mineralization in the system. And there's a number of these other deposits and companies that have done pretty well in the CRD space uh, in many cases, either with my involvement or uh, using the model that I and my team have developed. So it's no real surprise that Reina's principal project right here in the Santa Eulalia district falls right on the white line in the middle of Main Street as far as CRD deposits are concerned. Now, one of the ways Mexico has been able to show that jump in production that it's shown is because when I showed you that shotgun map with hundreds of deposits on it, 99% of those deposits were found in outcrop within 100 years of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. And the history of mining in Mexico and exploration in Mexico was simply keep following the stuff that you know about it, about their big deposits so we can mine them at larger and larger scale at lower and lower cost. But nobody went out and looked for new things. Those big jumps stem from application of modern exploration ideas to an incredibly well-endowed country, and the result is in fewer than 50, 20 years, major discoveries that are being brought into production one after another. Uh, and this process has just really begun. So here we are with Reina right here in Chihuahua, the Santa Eulalia district, the Gigi project, uh, and the Botopilas project. Botopilas is the highest grade silver property ever found in Mexico. The average grade of production from 1880 to 1913 was 2% silver. The ore bodies were essentially Brillo pads of crystallized native silver. Now, both of these projects were acquired by Reina from Mag Silver, and they were victims of Mag's success at Juan Escipio, which is a way of saying, Juan Escipio was so successful and has just continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger that the folks at MAG said, we, can't, can't, we don't have the bandwidth to deal with all these properties. We need to find a way to daylight some value for them, get them off of our balance sheet. We've been working with Jorge Monroy, Ramiro Monroy, who's the president of Reina, uh, in, with his uh, oriental contacts. And, uh, Jorge approached us and said, we'd like to take those properties into Reina. So MAG winds up with a 20% residual interest, at least through financing. And it's a way for MAG to daylight some value. And it's a way to get these projects off the blocks and back into operation. So these properties have been picked up from Reina, uh, by Reina with millions of dollars of exploration money already invested in them. The Santa Eulalia district, where the Gigi is, we're looking for the center of the system. This district produced a, f close to 50 million tons at average grades of 10 ounce silver and 15% combined lead and zinc. That means it's produced half a billion ounces of silver in, call it 310 years. So this makes it one of the biggest CRDs in the world. Actually, until Taylor came along, it was the biggest in the world. But the beauty of this one is half of this system is missing. We haven't found it yet. So when we look at the model, this is the piece that's been found. That was the world's biggest CRD and is certainly the second biggest in the world. But this portion of the system hasn't been found and that's what we're looking for. That's what we were looking for with MAG and 
Reyna is essentially looking to pick up the pieces where MAG left off. MAG's work included drilling, geophysics, mapping, satellite imagery, but a lot of it was never followed up because the will and the budgeting was not provided. So this is a little bit blurry, but if you look at the West Camp, this is the manto and chimney part of the system. This flesh-colored thing down here, or this beige, is the intrusions, the very distal intrusions that it's related with. Everything is telling us, and it's not just its ore body geometry, it's intrusive geometry, it's metal zoning, it's sulfur isotopes, for Christ's sake. But everything says this is the way back to the source, and when we get down to this part of the district, I mean, this produced for 300 years, down in here, they started routinely getting one to three grams of gold on top of 10 ounce silver, on top of 15% lead and zinc, and starting to get a whiff of copper, which is exactly the zoning you should expect to see in one of these systems. So the West Camp sits over here. That arrow I just showed you is saying that the source is down here somewhere. The other mine in the district, the other big one, is the San Antonio mine here in the East Camp. This is actively being mined by Grupo Mexico. It is controlled by a very strong structure that heads in this direction, MAG put some holes into this. In fact, our best successes were on the structure here, and that's sort of what got us stuck on looking at the eastern part of the district instead of the district as a whole. We own all of the, color, all of the colored claims, so we have a very large coherent land package which covers the majority of where we think the major targets are. This is what the drilling looks like historically. First hole in the, district, in, the, in the area was with Tech back in whew, 1993 or 4. It was an RC hole just to see how thick the volcanics were and if the limestone was there. That was very successful. We hit limestone at about 150 meters. MAG's initial drilling program was focused, supposed, it was focused on a geophysical anomaly down here. We explained the anomaly. It's a pre-mineral intrusion. We put, tried to put one hole into a fluorite breccia, cemented breccia pipe right here. That hole was lost as it entered into the area of the breccia pipe. We moved over to the east camp to the continuation of the San Antonio mine. This is where we got things like eight meters of 120 grams silver, uh, very high, 300 meters higher than the top levels of the mine. We drilled a series of holes here prior to 2008. In 2008, as we were drilling here, we did a geophysical airborne survey over the whole area. While we were waiting for the results, the Mexican government put a multi-million hectare claim over most of the state of Chihuahua to cover potential for coal bed methane. And of course, they did no follow-up, but it did tie up this property out here for the next five years, and of course, what happened was we wound up with a really whomping mag anomaly right out here, actually right here, and we waited until we could get that property to the east so we could drill that target. We drilled it. We got some more of the same pre-mineral intrusion down here, which basically means we've closed off the area for where this deposit has to be into this area here. That's a 1,000 meter scale bar right there. So we're looking at an area that's about three and a half kilometers in diameter. The source intrusions in most of these systems are about a kilometer in diameter. So there's lots of room for that thing to be in there and we, we, we think we're getting it cornered. So that's the area we want to explore. And we have a lot to work with. I mentioned the airborne survey that was done. Uh, it was a very sophisticated survey. Uh, we got some very good results out of it, with the exception of the drilling over here, based on the mag anomaly, there's been no drilling based on a half a million dollar geophysical survey. So all of these beautiful structures that you can see ripping through in the geophysics in all different manners here, big structural intersections, these are all directions that make sense in terms of what we know the ore controlling structures are in this district. There hasn't been a single drill hole put in on any of them. We can also see from satellite imagery, and this is Aster imagery. This was done back in the early 90s. Uh, beautiful, here's, here's what it looks like in 
True color, you can see the buff colored volcanics here. When you process them, you can bring out the alteration in them very nicely. Aster imagery has a 70 to 80 meter pixel. That means that's the smallest thing it can see is 70 meters on a side. We now have a satellite that can see things seven meters on a side, and we've done a new survey uh, over the property, and we're getting much, much higher resolution. We can actually map individual alteration minerals with this, and we've done it, working with Jerry Mitchell here in Vancouver. So this is actually work that Raina has done. This is the first step they've taken for themselves. We were fortunate somebody else had already paid for this region to be flown, so we were able to get the whole survey for $20,000. So where do we go from here? This is looking out over the area we have to explore. Topographically, it's pretty easy to work with. There's no big trees or anything that are in the way. There's no houses, towns, uh, villages, or anything like that to worry about. Uh, those initial targets I pointed out were over at the foot of this mountain. So there's essentially a three and a half kilometer area here that we have to work with. And yes, you can see that on the surface there are a few old Spanish era mine dumps from very shallow level prospecting. So we get some nice geochemistry leaking up in this area, telling us there's something down there, but none of this has ever been followed up with drilling. So what do we want to do? Gwen wants us on a fast track to drilling. So we put together the geophysics and imagery that's already been done and paid for. We finish up, we come back and remap some of the surface areas over where these anomalies are because Obviously, you want to make sure if there's something obvious, you can go out there and pick it up. We might want to do a little additional geophysics after that. Probably take us six months to permit it, and then we can drill. So we believe we can be drill-ready on this property in under a year. It's not the only arrow in Reina's um, quiver. Here's the Botapilas district in the canyons of uh, Chihuahua. Uh, this is, they now, there's now a paved road all the way to Botopilis. Uh, this district produced, based on historic records, about 300 million ounces of silver. Probably half of the production from this district was smuggled out to the west coast and off to San Francisco so that they could avoid paying the investors from New York their fair share of what was produced from this thing. There's some very interesting books about this, by the way. Uh, and until MAG got in there, uh, this district was a patchwork quilt of tiny claims. My, uh, my Mexican partners and I put the land package here together. It's one of the three properties that we started MAG with in 2005 using geophysics, airborne geophysics, which didn't work very well in such rugged terrain. Uh, we nonetheless targeted and intercepted a structure only 20 centimeters wide, but running 19 kilograms silver. Historically, mining in this district followed one centimeter calcite veins that would blow out into two meter widths of mineralization that was essentially inclined bodies of crystallized native silver up to 100 meters long on strike and 350 meters down the axis. And these things were essentially 60% native silver. This is what one month's production looked like back in 1906. 300,000 ounces of silver. Each of those bars weighs 25 kilograms. They made their own coinage in the district. Um, <clears throat> when you dilute the really high grade stuff that we got over the two meters of mineralization, it was still two meters of 2.5 kilograms silver. And uh, it's a very productive historic district. The, the geology of the district was poorly understood. We had a three-year program out there for mag drilling, geology. We completely put the, the geologic concepts of the district on its head, uh, and we wound up in a situation where we had prime drilling targets. The state of Chihuahua was going to be building a highway or a road across the mountain. It was going to go right across the top of our best targets so we could drill from that. Big rainstorm came along, washed it out, change of government, it all went up on blocks, and so those targets remain untested. But again, it's a question of fixing the road, submitting new permits, and going to work. So very quick to drill. Also have the Durazno project, which is a bit of an area play, but it's a really good area. 
Uh, so we have Agnico's Mines up here, we have Mulatos over here, lots of names that you recognize. Hard to believe that this much property was available for staking in this neighborhood, uh, but it was only a year and a half ago. So it looks like La India, it looks like Mulatos, lots and lots of territory to work with out here. So our budget, we think it's going to cost us about $500,000 to get Gigi into uh, drill readiness. Those numbers are quite, I don't want to say inflated, but let's just say there's plenty of, of, of margin uh, in those numbers. Uh, our first drilling campaign, one and a half million dollars. Second program, we would expect to spend another million and a half. Um, Baropilas, a million. Five million dollars uh, to bring both of these projects forward. That's actually part of the deal with MAG. So Reina has to invest that kind of money to earn into the properties. But that's all Reina has to do. There's no payments to MAG up front. There's nothing, there's no ongoing payments to MAG. Uh, so it's a very straightforward deal. So why would you invest in Reina Silver? The fundamental answer is if you have questions, talk to Bruce, because he's the man who who knows the details. I know the geology, I don't know the financing stuff. I spend the money, I don't raise the money. Um, so we have great technical expertise. Uh, modesty says I have to mention my name, but it, downplay it. Doug Kerwin, the former VP for exploration for I Ivanhoe, is gung-ho on this project. He's part of the team. And then we have the Mexican geologist who worked with me on these projects for 20 years who will be implementing the work. So we've got people who know the people, who know the country, who know the geology, and have a good track record uh, doing the work on the ground. Our board of directors includes Peter Jones, former CEO of HUD Bay. We've got strong capital markets experience, especially in Europe, Asia, and North America, and 20% ownership by MAG, and 27% ownership by management and board. So everybody involved has a lot of skin in the game. Um, we've got great assets. Gigi, this is actually where I did my doctorate in the Santa Eulalia district. We gotta find the other half of the system. Botopilus, extremely high grade historic producer. Lots of reasons to believe there's more there. So with that, that's basically the mags, the mag story. With this was the mag story. Two of these three properties were the, two of these properties were the properties we started mag with. So just to emphasize, these are the victims of mag success, and those are not bad pickings to be able to take up after. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. If you have questions about the financing, Bruce is the man. <laughs>